Chapter 10. Listening Far Enough Someone had carried her below and put her on a cot in what she realized was the Baron's study. Tahoe lay nearby, worried. A couple of the bats clung discreetly to the hangings. The osprey, missing an eye but miraculously alive, sat on the perch, letting Anua feed him raw fish. Dane sat up. Her head pounded worse than ever, and she felt her stomach heave. I think I'm going to be sick, she whispered. Anua got a basin to her just in time. What's the matter? she asked when Dane finished vomiting. Was it the dragon? No, she croaked. How long have I been out? Not too long. It's just after sunset. Looking at her shirt, Dane saw it was a gory mess. What happened? You had a nosebleed. What's wrong with your head? Can you tell? Anua smoothed her hair. It's important. You're important. They knew she was awake, and their struggle to get free increased. She didn't even know she'd stopped answering the comer until coolness entered her veins, driving back the hot fire of the headache. She opened her eyes. Callie held one of her hands, Thom another. The coolness had been theirs. Hello, she said. Her voice sounded like a rusty gate. Thank you. You're wearing yourself out. Maud stood behind the children, looking stern. You have to let some spells go. I know your magic is different, but your body's just like anybody else's. You're doing too much. Release some of your spells, or we can't answer for the consequences. Dane looked at Anua as the old woman steered Callie and Thom out. Easy for her to say, she muttered when the door was safely closed. Anua brought over a tray of food and put it on the table beside her cot. Eat. What magic do you have going, anyway? Hot cakes drenched in butter and syrup, fruit juice, and hot cocoa. The sugar cleared her head as she ate. I can't let them fight, she said, her mouth full. Let who fight? Ono scratched Ahoy's ears and patiently allowed the bats to settle on her shoulders as they listened to Dane. There was cold water to cut the sweetness. She drank half a tankard in one gulp. Them! She waved her fork in the direction of the woods outside the castle. The wild creatures! They won't let me be! They want to fight the raiders! They've been wanting to all day! Anua moved her fingers to Tahoe's spine, and the great dog sighed. I don't understand. Is it so bad if they fight? It's their home, too. Dane glared at her. They'll get killed! They're animals! It's not for them to get tangled in human stupidness. You won't like any of that, Anua told the bat that sniffed the tray. To the girl, she said, It seems to me we tangle them in our stupidity all the time. At least if you tell them how to fight, they have a chance. Dane got up and paced. You don't understand. Once I meet them or talk to them, I know them. They're my friends. They're part of me. When they get hurt and die, it hurts me. She pounded her chest to make her point. You think it doesn't hurt me when one of my horses dies? Dane blushed, embarrassed. I forgot. I'm sorry. The older woman sighed. We share this world, Dane. We can't hold apart from each other. Humans and animals are meant to be partners, aren't we, Tahoy? The great dog wagged his tail. He knows. He saved my life when my husband left me to die. I saved his life since. He can't cook or sing, and I can't chase rabbits, but we're partners all the same. The rider's ponies are full partners with their master. They have to be, and that's what I train them to be, so everyone has a better chance of surviving. The swoop's animals are in the same trap we are. Men broke into their homes, killed their families, threatened you, and you won't let them do anything for fear you'll be hurt. That's selfish. How would you like it if I took your bow and said I cared too much about you to let you fight? Dane winced. I see your point. You've made your friends helpless, just like Bandus made you helpless when they killed your family. Of course the animals fight you. Anua sighed. We have no choice in being hunted. Not animals, not humans. That's how the world is. The choice we do have is to take it or fight. Why don't you show them how not to get killed and let them decide? She studied her nails and added, I'll be honest with you. We need all the help we can get. Dane went to the window, fingering her badger's claw. I know what she means, she realized. They'll start with the catapults in the morning and smash our walls. Then they'll come take Thea and the children if they're alive. And the rest, Thom, the twins, Gimpy and Cloud and Mangle... There's got to be something my friends can do to help. Suddenly she remembered a talk she had heard Beery give the trainees. If your numbers are small, a rider group, say, it's idiotic to attack face-on when the enemy has superior numbers. 
But enemies are only men, and men scare easy. Use booby traps, snares, pits covered with branches, pebbles strewn across the road to cripple them and their mounts, foul their water sources, sneak into camp and ruin their food if you can. Keep up a racket all night so nobody gets any rest and you've got the sentries shooting at ghosts. Do they buy or steal food from the locals? Make sure the food they get their mitts on is moldy, stale, or wet. An enemy that's tired, ill-fed, and scared is an enemy who's half beat. We could do that, Dane thought now. If the soldiers here on land are crippled, they and everybody else might be able to fight their way through and escape before the ships get their warriors to the castle. Closing her eyes, she opened her mind to the extent of her range. The countless animals in the woods around Pirate Swoop began to clamor. They wanted her to release them. They wanted to tear and gnaw and leap. Quiet! she yelled. They obeyed. She reached first for minks, weasels, and martens, clever small animals with sharp claws and teeth. They were quick to grasp the images of leather wrappings, rope, and bowstrings. They must not be seen, she said over and over, with all her will behind it. They mustn't be caught. She pressed the image of bows, knives, and swords into their minds until they knew to run or hide if they saw a human with a weapon in his hand. Bears, wild boars, and woodchucks went after supplies once she made them promise to run at any signs of human attack. She left them pulling apart sacks and boxes of grain, cheese, salted meat, and vegetables. Shrews and voles offered to take care of the tea and coffee supplies. If there was an edible or drinkable scrap in the camp by morning, she would be surprised. Foxes, she asked to free the picketed horses and mules. Once she explained things, the strangers' mounts were happy to leave their masters and run for the woods. Some of the enemy's mules, once they were freed, came back to give water barrels a kick or a roll downhill. Owls and bats volunteered to keep the guards busy. Sentry after sentry had the unpleasant experience of an owl dropping on him silently from above, or of a bat flying directly into his face. Raccoons walked away with arrows and knives. Wolves howled on the fringes of the camp to be answered by wildcats of all sizes. Gods go with all of you, she thought sadly, and broke off the contact. The room was empty. Surprisingly, it hadn't taken long to muster her army at all. The candle that marked the time had burned down one hour's mark and half of another. I guess it's easier to get them to do what they want than it is from keeping them from doing it, she thought. Please, goddess, don't let my friends be hurt. She put on the clean clothes that lay on the cot, then let herself out. Numero was right down the hall, in a room filled with books. The skin around his face was slack and gray, his nose thrust out like the prow of a sinking ship. His crisp mane was matted with sweat, his face drenched with it. Checking the water jug on the table beside him, she saw it was empty. She went back and brought her own water to him. This time, when she came in, his eyes were open. They were dull and tired. Thanks, he whispered as she poured water for him. His hands shook when she gave him the tankard. Wait. She supported his head and shoulders, setting his grip on the tankard with her free hand. You're still keeping those dampeners off? He nodded as he drank and gasped when he was done. It hurt to talk casually when he looked half dead. You won't help him if you turn into a baby, she told herself sternly. Can I get you some food? I'll just throw up. He smiled. How do you like your first siege? That's very funny, she told him sourly. I'm so glad you've hung on to your sense of humor. Only think how scared I'd be if you hadn't. He closed his eyes and smiled. That's my magelet. Can't you let up for a while? He shook his head. The healers, they're still going. Dane, this afternoon. You said the dragon can think? It's educated? She. She's educated. Even the griffins are like my animals, with all that's in their heads jumbled together, higgledy-piggledy. Not her. She's read things in scrolls. I saw them in her mind. Amazing, he whispered. I'd heard stories, just never believed them. What stories? They're mages. Well, we saw that. She came right up on us. Even you didn't hear her until she was close. And she vanished. Do you hear her now? Dane listened hard. No, sir. But like you said, I didn't hear her until the last. She pulled off his boots and put a cushion under his feet. More cushions went behind his head. She noticed that he still clung to the toy Thom had put in his hand. There's got to be something else I can try. I let the land animals go. They'll do some damage. There's not enough creatures on the ships to work with, though. It's mostly rats out there. I can't work with rats. I've tried, but they don't even want to listen to me. Whales? Ask them to swim up under the barges, capsize them. The catapults are the biggest danger. 
then the red robes on the galleys. She thought it over. If whales are out there, I can't hear them. They're not in range. She chewed on a thumbnail until he knocked her hand away. I'm fair tired, too. The dragon sucked me almost dry. This time she didn't even get the thumbnail to her mouth before he grabbed her wrist. Pity I can't reach the sea. If there's a cold spot in the cellars, find George. He'll figure out a way to get you to the water. She saw another danger. What if the mages on the ships catch me? It's a risk, but you stand a better chance than anyone with the gift. Only a very few can detect wild magic. It's a skill mages in Karthik are discouraged from acquiring. Remember, they think it's old wives' tales. If someone out there could sense it, he'd have a difficult time convincing the others. If you're detected, you can escape among the seals and sea lions. He sighed. I know it's dangerous, and I hate to drive you this way, but we need a miracle. I'm hoping you can come up with one. She got up. Wish me luck. She hesitated, then kissed his cheek. He gave her a feeble hug. Luck, Majet. Dane looked down the length of rock at the castle's rear. George and Evan stood by with ropes and a sling. You sent folk down this way before. It's a better ride than it looks, the Baron assured her. They won't see you from the water because you're going down a rock chimney. When you return, just get in the sling and give the rope three big tugs. He showed her what he meant, and three little tugs. I'll have someone I trust on watch here for you. Got it? She nodded and fitted herself into the rope sling between the two men. Good thing I grew up in the mountains and I'm not afraid of heights, she said with false cheerfulness, easing herself out over the edge of the wall. I told you this is a long shot, didn't I? Several times, the Baron assured her. Don't worry, I'm expert in long shots, youngling. Been taking them all my life. What will you do for light? Evan asked. She looked at him in surprise. I don't need any. There's the moon, after all, and I see well in the dark. George nodded. Try to be topside when the fun starts in the morning. She smiled up at him. Wouldn't miss it for the world. The trip down the rock chimney seemed over almost before it started. At the bottom, she found herself on the beach. Here she climbed out of the sling, pulled off her boots, and rolled up her breeches. At a brisk walk, she followed the strip of beach north along the cliff face. She needed a place where she could anchor herself among the rocks. It wasn't her intention to be washed out to sea. Finally, she reached a spot that looked good. The cliffs were at her back. To the north lay more rock. The castle bluff shielded her from all sight of the enemy fleet, riding at anchor in the mouth of the swoop's cove. Gripping her badger's claw for luck, she wedged herself between two boulders and lowered herself into the ocean. She had to bite a lip to keep from shrieking at the cold wetness. Within seconds, she was numb to the waist. For good measure, she immersed her hands and sent her magic out. The salt water made her feel as if the dragon had never drained her magic. Her mind raced past tumbles of rock and kelp, past quite a few sunken ships. So that's why this is pirate swoop, she thought. They swooped out from the cove. She found the seals first and called a greeting. They wanted to play, but she explained she hadn't the time just now. On she went, beyond her normal range and into deep water. Whale songs rose all around her to fill the sea with their magic. She had found a pod of nearly forty blue whales. Three quarters of them were adults, each at least eighty feet long and weighing over one hundred and forty tons. Dane faltered, awed by their magnificence, then called, Hello! In a cave high over Dane's head, the dragon stopped nuzzling her little one. It was the mage child, the one who had restored her baby to life when she had thought it dead in her body. The dragon couldn't mistake that atrocious accent. Whales came into Dane's mind, huge shadows staring at a girl shadow. One, a hundred feet if he's an inch, Dane thought, a bit frightened, moved ahead of the others with grace and majesty. Who calls? This was nothing like talking with land animals, seals, or fish. Whales seemed wise in their own fashion, and words only partly conveyed the things they said. To their question, she gave them what she was, or how she saw herself, an image embroidered with feelings and ideas. They were amused. Why do you seek us out, tiny human calf? With images and ideas, she explained the siege, the Carthages, the release of the Stormwings, and the Dragon. They want to take our freedom, and they're hurting my friends. I came to ask your help. If four or five of you came up under the barges and overset them, and maybe one or two of the large boats, we'd have a chance. I know it's a big favor to ask. I can't say they won't hurt you. Maybe they can. But you're my best hope, you see. The chief whale heard her out politely. His answer, when it came, blasted into her mind and ears. No. She barely remembered that she was out in the open in time to choke back a scream. She bit down into her own wrist to smother it. 
You don't understand. How could she explain so they would care? She gave them Ottawa's wry humor, Fayette's leadership, Mary's love of the sea, George's intelligence, numerous curiosity. The enemy kills humans and animals who never hurt anyone. They brought monsters here. She gave them spitterins as well as storm wings. It never occurred to her to add the griffins or the dragon. We have calves there, little ones who depend on us to keep them safe. Roland, Callie, and Thom were as fresh in her mind as if they stood with her. She offered them to these distant cold judges. You wouldn't let your calves die. Grown humans may hunt you, but not these. Help me save them. The dragon looked at her newborn. Knowing the kit was dead in her belly had sent her in a rage to attack the humans. She had blamed them for stealing her from home at the start of her labor, had blamed them for the magic voyage that had killed the life in her. Her kit, her first, had been dead, until this girl child had put her hands on her breast. The pangs had begun again. Her kit had been born. Dragons do not give birth lightly. Do not face the loss of young lightly. You do not understand, mortal calf, said the whale leader. Explain it to me, please. She struggled to be polite. There had to be a way she could talk them around. We will not fight or kill. Not for your cause, not for any cause. Violence against higher life forms is disgusting. For centuries, the people have vowed that the taking of a higher life is an abomination. But Mary told me you've attacked ships that kill your kind. No. Once again, the force of the reply hurt. There have been accidents. There are times when one will go insane. Always, when the one who has fought understands what took place, that one starves himself, herself, to death, to pay for the sin. We will not fight. We will not kill. She had never heard such absolute refusal. It sounded in the marrow of her bones and through her nerve endings. Under its pressure, her head began to pound again. We'll die, then. Their machines will break our walls. They'll have us out as an octopus has a hermit crab out of its shell. My friends, in the air, on the land, they'll have died for nothing. You should not have asked them to fight. I didn't ask them. They wanted to, because they're my friends. There is no good reason to fight. There is no good reason to kill. The whale's voices were growing faint. Where are you going? Tears rolled down her cheeks. They were her last chance, and they wouldn't even listen. If ships are here, there is a chance of an accident. We cannot accept that risk. We go, far from this place where you make a killing ground. I didn't make it, she yelled, furious. They came to me. The whales were gone. The only sound in her mind and ears was the lapping of waves. It would happen again, just like at home. The queen would die before she'd let Carthagese take her or her children. Numor would burn out. The raiders would win. If she'd learned her lessons better, if she'd explained things at the palace instead of waiting until the badger came to her at the beach, she put her face in her hands and sobbed. If you listen hard and long, you can hear any of us, call any of us that you want. It sounded now so clearly that she looked up, trying to find the badger. He was nowhere to be seen. If you listen hard and long, you can hear any of us, call any of us that you want. That's what he had told her. Maybe she could catch up with the whales, convince them. Maybe she could bring them under her will. Surely that was like calling anyone she wanted to, wasn't it? It's wrong to force the whales to fight, a small voice in her mind argued, not when they hate it so. I won't let my people die, she told the voice. I can't. She took a deep breath, and another. She let go of herself, opening her mind entirely to wild magic. Grabbing her up, the copper fire took her west. She rolled along the ocean's bottom like a wave, hearing each click and gurgle the sea creatures made. Her awareness spread in a half circle, hearing the fleet, finding the departing whales. She would have talked to them, but the copper fire wrapped tighter around her mind and kept moving. Deeper and deeper, the ocean floor sank. With dreamy surprise, she slid around a patch of islands. Where had they come from? She dropped into ice water that was black as ink in her mind. In the west, past the islands, he lay. Ship killer, man eater, old as time. The mages had missed him when they sealed the divine realm centuries ago. He had lain on the bottom, the ultimate predator, dining on whales and human ships. His immense tentacles, each a mile long, stirred with interest. The kraken had never seen a little fish like her. Dane stared at him aghast. His was the body of an octopus with far too many arms, his mantle a mile and a half across. I will kill any fleet you like, little fish. His voice was filled with soft, deadly good humor. 
and you were talking to the whales, pacifists, all of them, enough to make me vomit. Just show me where these nasty raiders are. I can guarantee they won't trouble you for long. You'd never make it on time, she said to cover her real thought. I could never get rid of him. Leave that to me. Come, my dear, this is no time to be squeamish. Deals with demons, she thought nervously. It's a deal with a demon. Wait, what about Numer? Once he returns to full strength, he'll be a match for this monster. I hope he will, anyway, because this kraken is the only hope I have left. Please, goddess and horse lords, let this be a good choice. Dane thrust what she knew of the fleet at the giant thing, and fled as his laugh echoed all around her. She flashed the water faster than she would have believed possible. It was hard to say what she was doing, running from the kraken or racing to get to the swoop before sunrise. It was too late. When she opened her eyes, the incoming tide was up to her chin, and the sky overhead was pink. She struggled, fighting to get her tightly wedged body out from between the rocks. Everything was numb. Her hands couldn't get a purchase anywhere. How can I reach the castle, let alone the deck, she wondered, panting as she tried to free herself. And what can I tell them anyway? If those islands are what I think they are, they're the Copper Isles, four days sail out. If I didn't dream that what's it's that kraken, there won't be anything here in four days for him to eat. Curved silver bars closed around her middle gently. She looked up into the dragon's cat-like eyes. I will take you to your friends, little mage. The dragon wrapped her other forepaw around the one that gripped Dane. The girl held on to those silver claws, running her hands over them in awe. There was a tremendous jolt, and they were airborne. She screamed in delight to see the earth fall away below them, forgetting briefly all she had been through and all that was coming in the joy of flight. Behind her, she could feel the surge of the dragon's wings as they soared higher and higher. To their left, she saw the enemy, and the storming that dropped to Mahil Addis's ship. The red robes in the galleys and transports sat or lay at the prows of their ships, many clutching their heads in their hands. Slaves, bare but for a loincloth and a collar, ministered to the red robes. Her appearance, the dragon's appearance, had dramatic results. Men pointed and screamed. Archers scrambled for their weapons. One red robe got up and did something that involved waving hands. It resulted in a yellowish cloud that boiled their way. Amateurs, the dragon said coldly. When the cloud reached them, she blew on it, and it vanished. She banked gracefully, heading for the swoop. Tiny figures on the deck pointed at them, while any of the archers who might be in range had their bows up. Someone on the deck recognized Jane and called an order. Slowly the weapons came down. She peered at one of the dragon's toes, examining the bone structure and the violet scales. She picked up several tiny cuts on the scale edges, which were razor sharp. Excuse me, weren't you red yesterday? I was angry. We may change color to suit our wills, or to reflect strong emotion. The great creature hesitated, then went on. I heard you speak to the whales. She swiveled to face her bearer. You did? But these days nobody else hears when I'm talking to just one species. That may be so, among mortal creatures. It occurred to Dane her rescuer was a snob. We are mages of the air. Sounding anxious, she added, Could you send me home? I do not understand how I came to be here, and I wish to be with my family. We don't know how, Dane replied sadly as they descended. We're trying to learn, though. If you stay with us, we'll find a way to send you home. If we survive, that is. The dragon touched down more gracefully than she had the day before, and released Dane. Anua rolled, Callie, and Thom ran to hold her up as the great creature rose into the air and flew back along the cliff. Once more, she vanished in midair. Any luck? The Baron asked as he and Thet came over, their faces worn and exhausted. Dane looked around and saw Numer seated on the wall. He waved a shaky hand. No, she told her audience quietly. The whale said no. She couldn't even bring herself to look at Numer again. There, there might be something, but I don't know. I don't think it can be here in time. I'm sorry. The queen patted her arm. You tried. You've done so much already. I don't think the men from the camp outside the walls are fit to go into battle today, thanks to your friends. The dragon? George asked Dane. I don't know. She's not very strong. I could try and call her back. Well, well, all the little pigs tidy in one pen. Zane and Bitterclaws hovered overhead, just out of bowshot for the deck's guards. The Stormwing Queen's looks had not improved. Her eye socket continued to ooze. Whatever other magic they've got, Dane thought to herself, healing isn't part of it. Dane glanced around for her own bow and quiver. They were in Numer's lap. 
Thom sidled away from their group, backing up toward the mage with his hands open behind him. What's the answer, mortals? Will you surrender the three we want? We surrender nothing to you and your handlers, Thayet spat. Tell them they've just bought my husband's internal enmity. And mine. You won't live long enough to care about enmity, Bitterclaw snarled. Something hard and something leathery pressed against Dane's cold fingers. Thom had brought her bow, already strung, and her quiver. The girl's numb muscles couldn't respond fast enough. The storming laughed and climbed away when she tried to get her bow into a firing position. Dane swore, flexing her hands to get them limber again. "'Children, get below!' they had snapped. They wavered, and the queen roared, "Now!" They obeyed at a run. The girl looked seaward to find what had made the woman raise her voice so uncharacteristically. In the night, the four barges had been moved to the front, ahead of the ships, and each catapult was assembled and loaded with a stone ball. Two of them fired. The ball struck the clip face below the tower with an ear-splitting boom. The stone beneath their feet shook. The two remaining barges shifted. Must be the sorcerers that moved them, Dane thought, since there were no oars and no sails. Their catapults let fly. The first stone ball smashed into one of the other towers. The second hit the curtain wall. Already men were reloading the first two catapults. The dragon, her scales flaming gold, dropped on them from what looked like had been empty sky. She immediately put flight to the stories that her kind spat flame from their mouths. The fire came from her forepaws and devoured the sails on Edis's flagship. Banking hard, she cut directly across the face of one of the catapults to seize the stone ball loaded in it. Her flight sagged from the weight of the stone, but only momentarily. She dropped it on the next barge. The flat boat immediately listed to one side. Numer propped himself on Dane's shoulder. Wasn't she red yesterday? They changed color. Numer, she's not big enough. Maybe she's big enough to stop them. And it's justice, my magelet. They're the ones who brought her here in the first place. Archer shot at the dragon uselessly. The red robes tried their magic, but like Numer's, it washed off her. She hurled fire at a transport, burning it entirely before heading back to the catapults. Stormwings broke out of the woods on land and streaked to defend the ships. Dane watched, sobbing, as their claws cut deep into the dragon's sides. Can't you help? she demanded, forgetting the state he was in. I wish I could. Call her back this way if you can. Our archers can swat the Stormwings away from her. Dane called hard. The dragon ignored her to fall on the red robe at the prow of Edis's vessel. With him in her grip, she rose into the air and dropped him among a knot of Stormwings. They exploded. Scared for the lovely creature though she was, Dane cheered as the other red robes fled to more protected parts of their ships. Another catapult fired. Moving fast, the dragon was on the missile and had it in her talons. This time, when she dropped it onto a barge, she waited until she was much higher over it. When the stone hit it, it went straight through the wooden bottom. With the other stone balls off balance and rolling everywhere, the barge began to sink. Oh, gods, Numer whispered. Call her in, Dane, quick! She won't listen! What's wrong? The loading the slings with liquid fire. Call her in fast! Dane screamed with all the wild magic she could find. The dragon's only reply was a vision of a cave, high above the sea, with light coming out of its mouth. She won't come, Dane whispered, and tried again. The stormings gathered before the dragon, forcing her back. She fought to rise above them or fall below, but they blocked her. At the right moment, the two remaining catapults fired. Not stones this time, but balls of a clear, jelly-like substance. They splattered over the dragon and burst into flames. She uttered an ear-tearing shriek that none who saw the battle would ever forget, and dropped. Her flaming body crashed into a barge and sank it. Dane wailed her grief. I'll kill them, she screamed, putting an arrow to her bow with fingers that shook. Let them get near enough and I'll kill them. The catapult that remained in action fired. Its stone thudded into the wall at the base of the tower. Fall back, George ordered their guards, who obeyed. Onua, Dane, Numer, let's go. Numer looked out to sea and froze, his hand locked tight on Dane's shoulder. His eyes opened so wide that they started to bulge. What dice did the graveyard hag roll? Someone on the wall below screamed as a huge black tentacle darted out of the water to grip the catapult that had just fired. Clutching it as a baby might hold a rattle, the tentacle yanked the catapult and the barge it was fastened to onto its side. Another tentacle shot out of the water beside Edis's flagship. Up and up it soared, until it reached the crow's nest. Delicately, with precision, it gripped the nest and the man inside and snapped it off the mast. Friend of yours? Numer asked. His voice was very quiet, but she could hear him perfectly. No one at the castle was making a sound. Not exactly, she whispered. 
I guess he moves faster than I thought. A third tentacle crawled over the rim of the last barge, the one the dragon had knocked off balance. It snaked all the way across the bed, gripped the opposite rim, and flipped the entire thing over. Dane gulped. Oh dear, I think he's going to be nasty. How big did you say it was? George had come to stand with them, his face white under its tan. I didn't, she replied. Tentacles sprang up around the fleet like a forest of snakes, hemming it in. More tentacles groped into the boats to begin a systematic destruction. Numor straightened, blinking. The dampening spells are breaking up. Thayet had run to the opposite side of the deck, the part that looked out over the rest of the castle. Listen, she yelled. Horn calls split the air. From the woods to the east came a company of the king's own and the rest of the swoop's guards, the lioness at their head. From the northern woods came another company of the king's own. They fell on the raiders outside the wall as the stormwings converged on that battle. Anna with Thayet and George raced down the stairs to reach the curtain wall, where they'd have a better view. Numer sagged to the floor of the deck. I'm all used up, he told Dane, smiling at her. His eyes fluttered shut. Rest quick, she told him. You and Lady Alana are going to have to get rid of himself out there. He fluttered his hand at her, of course, of course, and let it fall. Within seconds, he was out cold. To her surprise, she heard the sounds of hoofs on stone. Cloud emerged from the stair, her withers streaked with sweat. I have been looking all over for you, the pony told her crossly, coming to sniff Dane from top to toe. First they tell me you got sick, then they tell me you went down to the ocean, then... Uh-oh. Dane looked up. Zane and Bitterclaws had returned. I suppose you think very well of yourself, girly. I suppose you think you did something wonderful calling up that greedy guts. She jerked her head in the direction of the Kraken, who continued his breakfast of ships. The girl shook with fury. She hadn't taken her arrow off the string, but it would do no good. Even supposing she could aim her bow, she had lost the strength to draw it. Numer wasn't the only one to be all used up. The Stormwing Queen knew it, too. She fluttered closer. You're mine, she said with a grin. I'll be on you before you make this stare. And maybe I'll cut up your long friend here, too, before I go. You think about that a moment. It'll be your fault that he dies. Liar, Dane spat. Folk like you always lay the blame on somebody else. If I'd listened to talk like that, I'd have let myself get killed by my own people months ago. They should have killed you, girly. The storming drew in closer yet. You call me a monster? What are you? My gods made me. You're just a freak. All you do is get your friends killed like that poor dragon. They'd be better off if you just threw yourself off the cliff right now. Cloud leaned against Dane's thigh. Suddenly the girl was filled with energy. She was as fresh and strong as if she'd had a full night's sleep. Lightning fast, she swung her bow up and loosed. The arrow went clean through Zane and Bitterclaw's neck as the creature gave voice to a choked scream. She dropped, trying to claw the arrow out of her flesh, until her body smashed to the rocks below. As she tumbled end over end to the sea, her own wing feathers cut her to pieces. Dane and Cloud stuck their heads over the low wall, watching the stormwing die in silence. Finally, the girl straightened. Her newfound strength was gone. Is she right? Dane asked the pony. She isn't. Cloud said firmly. Your friends all make their own choices to live or die for you. I've yet to see you force death on a friend. Carefully, muscles aching, Dane unstrung her bow and coiled the string, tucking it into her pocket. Did I know you could do that? She asked. Give me strength like you did? Of course not, was the pony's smug reply. We people don't have to give you all our secrets. Now, she tells me. Dane sat with Numer and curled up against him. Wake me in time for supper, she told Cloud tiredly. Of course, the mare said, knowing her human was already asleep. There was a blanket where Nuer had been sitting when the dragon returned Dane to the castle. Cloud dragged it over, covering the man and the girl. She assumed a guard stance near the two of them and waited for the rest of the fighting to end. Epilogue Her dreams were filled with the vision, the one the dragon had given her of a hole in the cliff. At first, the silvery light from the cave had been strong almost enough to read by. As she dreamed the same thing over and over, the light dimmed. Just before she awoke, it was almost gone. How long? Her voice emerged in a whispering croak. Her throat was so dry she began to cough. Numer hauled her into a sitting position and put a canteen to her lips. Drink. Dane gasped, swallowed a mouthful of liquid, gasped again, and drank some more. Finally, she drained the canteen. How long? she asked again. The rest of the day the Kraken arrived, then yesterday and today. He gave her a cake, sweet with honey and filled with raisins and nuts. Dane ate it and took another. I have to go out. 
Don't be silly, he told her. You're weak. You're staying here. That's where you're wrong, she replied. She swung her feet off the bed and stood. For a moment the room spun, then settled into place. She was in the stable. They had placed her cot in an empty stall, where the ponies could watch her. Her bat friends hung in the rafters overhead, where the loft ended, leaving plenty of room for the one-eyed osprey to perch. None of the animals were pleased when Dane started to pull on her clothes. Cloud in particular glared at her over the partition. Remembering something, she froze. My friends, the woods creatures! Some were killed, Numer said gently. Once the enemy was driven off, we found the injured ones. They've been cared for. There weren't as many casualties as you'd think. You gave them the right advice. Good, she said, a weight off her mind. She went on dressing. You need to rest and eat. I'm still weak on my pens myself. There's something I have to take care of, Dane said. Now. She stuffed her feet into her boots. Her friend sighed. Then wait a moment. We need an armed escort. There may still be enemies out there. And let's get horses. Where are we going? She closed her eyes and recalled the vision. Northwest, she said finally. Along the cliff. We have to hurry. He smiled at her. Then we'll hurry. She couldn't even manage Cloud's tack. Soon after the mage had left, Miri raced in. Master Numer says you need someone to help you saddle up. She gave Cloud a worried look. You behave, she told the mare, or wave walker help me, I'll singe your tail. Cloud stood meekly and did as she was told. Dane was glad to sit on her cot and watch. What time is it? Afternoon, the older girl said. You beat Master Numer by half a day. He got up this morning. He looks a lot better. She gasped. Oh, I forgot, the kraken! Mary grinned. Don't worry about that one, she said, tightening cinches. Once Master Numer is up, he and Lady Alana had a talk with that old ship killer. You should have seen him scuttle out of the cove. He sucked the water after him and left the bottom dry. The lioness had to pull it back in. She patted Cloud's withers. There you are. All set. Dane rose and took the reins. You've come a long way since we met. Mary grinned shyly. Thanks. It means a lot to hear you say so. They waited in the courtyard as castle hostlers brought out dark moon spots and horses belonging to the keen zone. Here, shading her eyes from the sun, the girl saw the first repercussions of what she had done. The stable hands had liked to talk to her before the enemy invasion. Now they avoided her glance and kept well away from her. A small explosion struck her back and almost knocked her off her feet. It was followed by a second and a third. Whatever the hostlers might think, Roland, Callie, and Thom were glad to see her up. Her eyes stinging, Dane knelt to return the hug. There, there, she whispered more to herself than the children. It's all right. It's over. Can we go too, Ma? Thom asked the lioness as she approached. No, my dears, some other time. We're not sure the enemy is completely gone. The knight grinned at Dane. You've been a busy girl. Dane grinned back. So have you. Looking at the men of the King's Own who followed Alana, she recognized Akim and his companions. It's good to see you, she told them. The honor is ours, Akim replied gravely. You said it was urgent, Numa reminded her. The group left the castle at a trot, following Dane. The vision's lure was powerful in her mind. Following it, she guided Cloud onto a road that ran along the cliff face, high above the sea. Gulls followed them, filling the air with their cries. Alana drew level with the girl. I've yet to thank you, she said quietly. I never thought you'd have to keep your promise in such a way. She smiled at the knight. What happened? They lured you off, didn't they? Alana nodded. The ogres were real enough. They kept us busy for more than a day. By the time we felt we could return, there was a small army between us and home. Lucky for me, Hakim rode in with two companies of the own. They were still in chorus when Numer sent word you were up to your eyeballs in trouble. Dane held up a hand. They were close. Listening, she dismounted. Stay put, she ordered Cloud. Numer came after her on foot. What are we looking for, exactly? She was about to say she wasn't sure when the ground dropped under her. For a second time, she had the doubtful pleasure of being picked up to hang in midair. This time, at least, she wasn't half drowned. Looking down, she saw she had almost gone through the roof of the cave that opened in the cliff face. Can you send me down in there? She wasn't sure who had her, Alana or Numer. I found it. The lioness chuckled. You have a unique way of finding things. Gently, Dane was lowered through the hole she had made until she was on the stone floor of the cave below. There was a rustle nearby and a chirp. A silver shape, no bigger than a large cat, came over on legs that hadn't yet mastered the skill of walking. She knelt. The little creature stared at her with slit-pupiled blue eyes. Tiny, scaled forepaws gripped her breeches. 
The baby dragon pulled herself up onto her hind legs. Dane's eyes burned with tears. I'm sorry, she told the dragonette. I guess I'm your ma now. She scooped up the armful of kit and looked up at the hole she'd made in the roof. Alana, Numer, and Hakim stared down at her. The dragon had a little one, she explained. She's hungry. Carefully, the lioness raised her and the dragonette up through the hole to stand them on solid ground. Dane managed to construct a bottle that would hold up under the kit's small but sharp teeth. After consulting with the healer Maud, she warmed goat's milk and loaded it with butter to make it even richer. The dragonette gulped a pint of the mess, burped, and fell asleep in Dane's lap. The entire operation was watched in awe and fascination by the Queen, Alana, George, Numer, Buri, Anua, Maud, and the children. Gently, Callie ran a finger along the sleeping animal's flank. She's so soft, the girl whispered. What's her name? Sky Song, Dane said. She frowned. Where had that knowledge come from? I guess her mom passed that on to me, too, before she died. Coming to a decision, she looked at Anua. I don't think I can stay with the riders past the summer. My duty's to this little one now. You can still make your home with us, they had told her. That is, if you wish. I know my lord and I would prefer to have you in the palace. Dane stared at her. Me? You. Thea took her hand. Verela Dane Sarasri, you saved my life and the lives of my children. A home is the very least we can offer you. Dane lowered her head to hide her beet red face. But we want her to live here, objected George. Surely we're more suited as a home, being on the sea and near Master Numer and all. He grinned. And being how our girl made so many friends in our woods. I don't see why she can't live in my tower, Numer protested. She is my apprentice after all. A girl's got to have females to talk to, Alana informed him. You haven't even gotten a new housekeeper since the last one interrupted one of your experiments. Come live in the palace, Callie and Roland begged, tugging her arm. We'll be good forever and ever if you will. Skysong sneezed and shifted in Dane's lap. Shh, Maud ordered. You'll wake the baby. The children hushed, guilty-faced. You don't have to decide now, Anwa pointed out. I don't see why rearing Skysong should interfere with helping me this summer. Dane looked at these unusual people who had become friends and laughed. It's fair funny, she explained. I've gone from having no home to having too many. The lioness smiled and put a hand on her shoulder. Welcome to Tortle, she said.